So I think we are ready to start. Welcome to everybody who is attending this webinar from Land Portal. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Daniel Hayward. Um, I am not a cat. I am a knowledge engagement coordinator for Land Portal and also project coordinator for the Mekong Land Research Forum based at Chiang Mai University in Thailand. Uh, in a moment, we'll be introducing our four main panelists uh, and hearing from three Southeast Asian countries on developments in responsible agricultural investment and how they have potential to recognize and protect land tenure for smallholders and the rural poor. Before that, we will be introducing a new, newly published set of country portfolios, um, providing an entry point to learn about land relations in a number of Southeast Asian countries. But first of all, a few logistical notes before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and will be available later for consultation on the Land Portal website and on our YouTube channel. Following presentations from our panelists, we will have 30 minutes to address your questions. Now for these, please use the Q&A feature to pose your questions, not the chat box. However, if you want to post your questions so that everyone sees them, you can subsequently put them into the chat box. Before going to the panelists, a bit of context. This webinar is part of an upcoming series of sessions named Country Insights. Over the past year, Land Portal has been compiling a series of country portfolios, summarizing the history and development of a country's land governance system and analyzing key elements of this system, such as the land legislation, trends in land use, how women access and control land, investments, and so on. Romy will be posting the links to these portfolios, portfolios in the chat, if you're curious. The portfolios act as an entry point to learn about a new country, suggesting further sources for deeper exploration and linking to relevant news reports, blogs, and data sets. To have a look at them, you can go to the Land Portal website and click on the tab countries. In the last month, we have published portfolios on Cambodia, which was written by my colleague Anne Hennings, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. And over the next few minutes, I'd just like to give a few reflections on these four countries. Now, in geographical terms, Indonesia is by far the largest with a population of 270 million people, a total land area of just over 1.9 million square kilometers and with 300 distinct ethnic and linguistic groups. At the other end of the spectrum, Singapore is the smallest, a city state, state with 5.7 million people crammed into just 719 square kilometers, making it one of the most densely populated countries in the world. All four countries endured periods of colonial rule. Indonesia was the first to achieve independence from Dutch rule in 1945. Singapore was the last country to do so in 1963, initially as part of the Federation of Malaysia, only to split from it in 1965 and become a sovereign state. For the legal land system in each country, both Indonesia and Malaysia are highly pluralistic, acknowledging statutory Islamic and customary laws. Malaysia does so within a federal uh, political structure with law and regulation op operating at both federal and state levels in peninsular Malaysia and then the states of Sarawak and Sabah having their own legal systems to draw upon. On the other hand, Singapore has a highly centralized land planning system. By developing vertically due to land scarcity, 90% of people in Singapore are homeowners in affordable high rise housing. And yet the state owns 90% of the land. 
Near a quarter of all this land is reclaimed, and this links to Cambodia in the controversial provision of sand to, to feed the reclamation process. Meanwhile, Cambodia itself suffered during a destructive period of rule under the Khmer Rouge from 1975 to 9, where private property rights were abolished and existing land documents destroyed. In terms of land use, Singapore is classed as 100% urban, although there are pockets of forests and agricultural areas. The country presently imports 90% of its food needs, and there is an aim to increase domestic food production to contribute 30% of needs under its 30 by 30 target. Despite a predominance of forest cover in Indonesia and Malaysia, in both countries, a majority of the population reside in urban areas. In Indonesia, this represents 56% of the population with the main urban center being Jakarta. In Malaysia, the figure is 77%, which is one of the higher rates in Southeast Asia. Cambodia, on the other hand, remains predominantly a rural populace with only around a quarter of the population residing in urban areas. The final area I would like to mention leads us on to the main topic for today's webinar. Turning land into capital has been a key strategy for economic development in Indonesia, Malaysia and Cambodia. The exception here is Singapore, which due to its limited land size has become the strongest economy in Southeast Asia as a leader in finance and technology. Indonesia has the third largest area of tropical rainforest in the world, and 70% of all land is designated state forest land. Despite the claims of forest-based communities, there is a large corporate presence for mining, logging, and oil palm production. Malaysia sees similar disputes between commercial use and customary claims on forest land. For oil palm, there's been a remarkable rise from just 433 square kilometers in 1961 to over 52,000 square kilometers in 2018. In Cambodia, there is a legacy of large scale land concessions from colonial times to the present day, more recently termed as economic land concessions or ELCs. And these take place for flex crops such as sugar and rubber. After large concerns as to their productivity, a moratorium was placed on new concessions in 2012. And there are also land deals for mining and hydropower projects. Now, I think that's enough of a summary on the countries to start with. And we do urge you to go to our country pages to have a look for further detail. Before we start with the main discussion, we would like to conduct a very quick poll so that we know who is attending this webinar. So we have two questions in the poll and some options will be shortly coming up on your screen. The first question is, where are you based? And we should have a question coming up, which gives some options. These are regions around the world? Uh, yes, I, I've just liked, uh, this is Romy from Land Portal. If, um, yeah. Neil, can you, yes. Good, so as you should see on your screen now in which region are you based? And um, if everyone could quickly fill in a box, we will. have the results in approximately 20 seconds or so. The second question, scroll, scrolling down, is which sector do you represent? And we have a number of categories here, government, civil society or NGOs, private sector, international organizations, universities, knowledge institutes, or other. So please do take a moment to vote on these two questions and we will reveal the results in a moment.
We're almost there. So yes, I can see the results here. Um, we have, in, 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 for the first question, we have an interesting mix. The, the highest proportion of participants here today are based in Europe, that's 40%, followed by Southeast Asia, 34%, and then Africa, 14%. Perhaps for the timing of this webinar, it's not surprising we have less but uh, less participants from the Americas. So welcome to all our, um, all our viewers from around the world. It's nice to see such a mix. For the second question, which sector do you represent? We have 40% of viewers from universities or knowledge institutes. Um, the second highest category was civil society NGOs, 20%. Then joint third is international organizations and government on 14, 14, 14%. Then private sector, 6% and other 6% as well. So I think we have a quite a nice, healthy range. And it's, it's also very nice to see that we have so many colleagues from government attending today. So again, thank you all for coming. So, now on to the main topic of the webinar. This takes three out of our four countries, namely Indonesia, Malaysia and Cambodia, and looks deeper into the impact of investments to smallholders and other land users. There are numerous cases where such groups have lost access rights to their land due to its acquisition for commercial purposes often without receiving adequate compensation. This is despite evidence that large-scale acquisitions, particularly concessions, have delivered neither the economic growth promoted by national governments, nor the profits desired by investors, be they domestic or foreign. As a result, there is a growing interest in alternative investment models. The challenge is to try and encourage investor confidence while also promoting sustainable practices and inclusivity in land deals so that smallholders have an opportunity to share both in the benefits of production and achieve secure tenure over their land. For some further country-based perspectives, I would like to introduce our presenters for today. Our first presenter is Ms. Chan Sobi Ngon, who is a researcher and operations manager at the Center for policy studies in Cambodia. Her research interests focus on modernized agricultural practices for smallholder farmers, agricultural value chains, linkages between gender, agriculture, and climate change, and responsible land governance. She is presently a researcher for the study project Research on Agricultural Investment Business Models in Cambodia. The second speaker is Mr. Andiko Sutan Mankayo, who serves as Senior Sustainability and Human Rights Lawyer in ASM Law Office. He is currently a member of the Steering Committee on Indonesia National Climate Change Control and specializes in environmental justice. Additionally, he has worked for a range of institutions in Indonesia, including the Indonesia National Forestry Council, HUMA, Association for Community and Ecologically Based Law Reform, and Indonesian Legal Aid Foundation. Our third presenter is Dr. Reza Azmi. Dr. Azmi has a background in environmental sciences with experience around Asia and Africa. He is executive director and founder of Malaysia-based Wild Asia, promoting conservation and helping connect consumers, businesses, and traders to reduce their environmental footprint. In particular, the project promotes responsible oil palm production and responsible tourism. Finally, at the end of this webinar, we will be inviting Dr. Rob Cole to give some final reflections. Rob is an advisor on responsible agricultural investment for the Mekong Region Land Governance Project, or MRLG. MRLG works on smallholder tenure security in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. Rob's role at MRLG aims to promote 
do no harm agribusiness agri investments that are mutually beneficial for farmers and investors while protecting the land base that is vital to rural livelihoods. During this session, I will ask three questions to which the panelists will respond over the next 45 minutes. Then we will have approximately 30 minutes for questions from the public. Finally, Dr. Rob Cull will give a few closing remarks to round off the seminar. So our first question is, how have land investments in your country impacted upon the land tenure security of smallholders and the rural poor. Now, could we have a first response for the case of Malaysia from Reza Azmi? Thank you. Hi, Daniel, thanks very much. Um, I think the, the context for Malaysia is that we've been part of this 100 year, I guess this 100 year experiment in industrial agriculture of large land scale investments. And these are thousands of hectares uh, of land developed for essentially commodities, which are not necessarily a product used within the domestic markets, but really destined for foreign markets, um, for example, rubber, oil palm and timber. And, and I felt that before we get into, uh, you know, the sort of the, the dramas and the problems of today, it's good to have a reflection of the past. And our colonial, uh, I mean, so Malaysia shares this colonial history with a number of other countries around the world. And what we can see is that if you look back about a hundred plus years ago, the first model of plantations was starting to be rolled out. Uh, for example, you had the tobacco plantations in, in America, um, you had the first prospects of, of rubber and, and other types of plantation commodities in, in Malaysia. Now, what I can understand from this is that we, we've sort of seen land development in about four phases. So 100 years ago, it was you know, what I would imagine are sort of, sort of mavericks, you know, these pioneers who go out and are, are felling jungle and, and opening up land. And much of this is on the back of private equity or this idea that they were part of a business chain where they could produce a crop cheaply sold back to London at a, at a cheap rate so that this could be then further traded in, in these European markets. And I think this is the model that sort of shaped a lot of finance and trade in Southeast Asia. Then the second phase is in the sort of 1950s where we were now under sort of a, a sort of nationalistic, uh, you know, we, we're now in de an independent government. And the next phase of large scale developments were largely backed by the World Bank or these other financial institutions under this guise of development. Uh, so these, for example, I think Daniel mentioned Felda. So this was a case of uh, large investments for uh, smallholder, uh, for land, landless smallholders. And this started a, a, the next phase uh, in Malaysia. So, so we had the Mavericks, we had then this development phase. And then by the, about the 1980s, uh, we saw this wave of, of nationalism. So the Mavericks of a hundred years ago are now landed, uh, are landowners. And a lot of these landowners were being acquired by the Malaysian government in some way or another, where government link companies started to, to buy back a lot of these companies and keep it under Malaysian control. So, so this, you know, so we start seeing the birth of what are government linked companies. So Time Derby of today is, is, is a result of one of those uh, acquisitions. Then the fourth phase, uh, you know, what, what I've seen in the last 10 or 20 years, uh, this sort of new generation of Mavericks with private investments, with speculators, all looking at land development projects as a way to make money. Now, if I look back, the reason why the early large scale developments worked in Malaysia was because our population structure was small. The 
and then the second factor which I feel is actually a lot of the land was was held either within uh, in a, uh, the, the sort of control of a few uh, royalties or uh, and then the third factor was also that the fact that these are forested lands far far away from these uh, you know the sort of coastal areas where people actually were so I feel that this model maybe worked well in this context but the problem is that this large-scale development model promoted for different reasons, whether it's development or for, for making money, um, was then brought to regions where customary lands are the dominant land, uh, sort of uh, the dominant land factor. So this, this is where we start seeing the problem. Uh, so if you go to Papua New Guinea, you go to Sarawak, you go to Africa, all the conflicts between what the state understands as concessions versus what the local people understand as their rights, there is a mix match here. And, and often the, the people who are residing in these concession areas are not really in a position of power because they are power brokers, there's government uh, officials, there's the private sector, there's, the, you know, there's a whole bunch of different people who are actually calling all the shots. So I think this is the, the sort of context to, I, I think a lot of the problems that we're starting to see uh, and is being reported, et cetera. And so I, I think I'll stop there because I, I think I wanted to sort of just set the scene so that uh, we could kind of pass on to, to now the, the, the problems that we're seeing uh, in Indonesia and Cambodia. Thank you so much, Reza. I, I, I think this is, really important reminder for us that to understand present day dynamics, we, we often, we do need to take that historical approach and uh, see how maybe what worked in the past, how, how those dynamics have changed, caused problems in the present day. So thank you so much for that. Um, for our second response, um, I'd like to hear about impacts of land investments in Cambodia. So I'd like to go to Chan So Bing on. If I could ask you to unmute your microphone, please. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. So this is Sophie from Cambodia. Uh, before I answer the question, I'd like to give an overview of the brief history of the land investment in Cambodia. So the government of Cambodia started to grant ESG project in early 1990s. And the main purpose uh, are to develop intensive agricultural and agro-industrial activities, increase employment, and uh, diversify livelihood opportunity in rural areas. And another purpose is also to uh, generate state revenue through economic land use. Uh, currently, there are 231 ELC projects covering on around 1.1 million hectares. And the life cycle of the project, the ELC project was uh, 99 years, but later on the government negotiated with the, those uh, ELC company to reduce the life cycle to only 50 years. So some uh, are under negotiation and some also agreed to reduce the ELC project to 50 years. Uh, this ELC uh, project is very significant for land investment in Cambodia and that they have also created uh, different uh, impacts like on a commun communal land titling. Uh, it has direct the process of formal communal uh, land registration in Cambodia. It also, the project also impact on the use of communal land and resources such as pond, pastoral and uh, pastoral land, uh, non-timber forest product, upland farm, and also a secret uh, forest for the indigenous uh, people. The control was all impacts because of the, of the ESC project, a uh, complex, uh, complicated uh, land conflict between the local people and the investor. It also threatening to the land tenures of local people because uh, in Cambodia, and especially in rural area, uh, not all people have their hard land titling, which are considered full legitimate of the ownership. And with the arrival of the ESG project, some of them lost their land because uh, they have no uh, legitimate rights. 
uh, acknowledged by the company and also by the government. And some are being evacuated from their land. So they lost access to natural resources on the land and also the surrounding environment that uh, have been the main sources of their livelihood. Uh, given this, uh, through in the conflict resolution between the investor and the local people that implemented by the Cambodian government, through Leo cut, uh, we call it Leopard Skin Policy to address the land conflict uh, between 2012 and 2013, uh, some people also get their land uh, title registered. Uh, be the impact of the land investment through this, these ESE projects also led to new land acquisition by uh, some people in rural areas because after losing their land to the investment company, they had to find a substitute way to maintain their livelihood and access to the natural resources. Given the those complex impact and uh, land conflict, there are some positive impacts from the ELC investment project, uh, particularly on rural employment uh, that have created full-time and part-time job for rural people that they can work with the company through labor work. So those people can also generate extra income to support their livelihood after they, uh, that some of them have lost their land. It also contributes to improve the local economic activities and also enhance uh, the local infrastructure development, especially the rural roads in Cambodia, school and summer health center as well. I think I stop here. I uh, let hear from the uh, other country. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvie. Um, good to hear about this, this complexity and also to hear about some sort of positive as well as negative outcomes from Cambodia. Um, finally, to hear about Indonesia, um, which like Malaysia has a legacy of land investment for oil palm production, um, I'd like to invite some comments from uh, Mr. Andiko. Oh, and I'd like to add also that um, okay. the internet reception, Miss, there is um, no working camera there, so we have a we won't be having a, a, a view of Miss Andiko directly. Floor is okay, yours. thank you, Pak Daniel and all. Uh, nice to join with the seminar. Uh, from Indonesia, uh, I would like to explain a little bit about the history context, yeah. After Indonesia independent, uh, Indonesian got the big problem about the gap of uh, tenure uh, among uh, parties inside Indonesia. Indonesia tried to develop the industry, uh, especially uh, based on the land. land yeah. For example, uh, palm oil, plantation, and rubber. But when my government uh, was uh, start uh, the development of uh, plantation in Indonesia, uh, the agrarian problem uh, still uh, eh, still running. Uh, there is no good improvement about how to resolve the the gap of uh, tenor, and this this situation uh, bring the many problems for Indonesia investment. For example, uh, we met with the conflict of uh, tenure in Indonesia. And until uh, 2009, uh, Indonesia uh, is number one of palm oil producer around the world. And 12.3 million hectare uh, palm oil plantation owned by 25 conglomerates. And a few, yeah, uh, maybe a few million hectare palm oil owned by smallholder, but uh, not so good condition in the ground. And the state forest area, 95% uh, of uh, the license was giving to the company, uh, look like timber company and uh, 
timber plantation company, but only five point uh, uh, point uh, twelve yeah percent uh, the license uh, owned by community, and uh, based on this condition. Uh, from once uh, uh, someone uh, uh, from the one reset yeah a few years ago uh, world bank reset yeah talking about one percent of population in indonesia control uh, 68 percent uh, national wealth nah based on this condition uh, the land investment in indonesia Meet with the many conflict, uh, environmental conflict or social conflict in the ground. Now the problem, uh, the investment doesn't uh, have some obligation to talking. The the idea, yeah, the idea of investment doesn't have obligation to talk with community in first step, yeah. The community, uh, the investment uh, coming and will be invite the community after he got the license and he need some space to negotiate, yeah, or make some negotiation with community to take over his land, yeah. And the model of uh, land acquisition in the big big uh, business land business uh, business in Indonesia only give the compensation now if we talking about the compensation we talking about the the big transfer right from the community smallholder to the big company and uh and that time the situation changed in, in the ground in indonesia the the farmer will be transferred to be uh, employee or uh, different uh, job in the ground there is no uh, idea about that yeah now after that uh, slowly slowly uh, the indonesian law uh, try to develop uh, some solution yeah but not enough i think yeah for example yeah, my, my government uh, say Andiko, I just want to check you are still here. We have lost your volume for a moment. If we have lost him for a moment, we'll, we'll, we'll give a, a few more seconds for Andiko to rejoin us. Otherwise, I was I was going to make the comment that I think it's very interesting to make this close linkage between land investments and uh, and inequality, and I think um, there's a there is um, a lot more interest in, in inequality in a, in a wide range of fields, and I certainly know there's been this recent uh, publication by through Oxfam on inequality. So if we I think um, Andiko has left us for a mo moment. He'll probably be trying to come back in. Um, what we will do, I think he was nearly at the end of the answer. We will give him the opportunity that if he comes back to finish his answer and move on to the next question. However, what, what we will do in the meantime is uh, move on to the second question and get a first response. So the second question is, what are the late having looked at what is this kind of the status of impact from land investments on on land tenure for smallholders what are the latest interests and developments that open the door for responsible agricultural investment and the inclusion of smallholders so whilst we wait for andiko to come back um i'd like to ask for a first response from chan Sobingon for cambodia thank you um, thank you, Daniel, for the second question. So the 
talking about the int uh, latest interest and development that opened the door for responsible agricultural investment. I think in Cambodia, we now uh, focus on the track farming uh, that uh, is considered as the latest development that are opened the door to promote the inclusive of smallholder farmers. It is the business model that are implemented between the agricultural cooperative that have uh, smallholder farmers with the private companies. It can be the ESC project or other private uh, investors to produce agricultural product for export as per the agree contract. There are also uh, other initiatives by the government, NGOs and company to explore potential opportunity that the land investor, uh, particularly the ELC uh, companies who have processing plan or factory to work with smallholder farmer through contract farming. Uh, but it's still uh, under the exploration and the research and discussion. Uh, we are not sure uh, if it is possible and if it is possible, what uh, kind of business model uh, should be implemented to include the smallholder uh, farmer. Uh, from my working experience, uh, the positive business uh, model that uh, can be called inclusive of smallholder farmers is this contract farming for organic cassava production and the standard cashew nut production in previous province uh, between the private companies and the agricultural cooperative that are consists of the smallholder farmers. So how it works, uh, so let's say the organic cassava production uh, contract farming between the Cambodian agricultural cooperative and uh, cooperation called uh, CACC with uh, 11 agricultural cooperative, uh, cooperative in uh, private here. They signed a contract, annual contract with uh, AC, the agricultural cooperative, to produce a specific amount of organic cassava and they provide technical support uh, to ensure the organic quality while the farmers through the uh, agricultural cooperative have to ensure that the quality monitoring and uh, organic cassava production and sell to the company as per the agreed contract and uh, quantity. Uh, Besides it, for the standard cash nut, uh, cash nut uh, model, it's with uh, Santana Agro product. So this, this company, they have their own plantation. They have their processing factories, but they, uh, the plantation, their own plantation cannot produce uh, enough cash nut for the uh, for the processing uh, factory. So they want to work with the smallholder farmers through the, through the contract farming, but they also uh, buy the cashew nuts through the open market from smallholder farmers and the commercial farm to supply uh, to their factory, a uh, processing factory. Uh, this can be considered as the exclusive business model, even uh, through contract or under the contract negotiation, or they buy the product from the smallholder farmers, but at least they include the smallholder farmer in the process of their business development. I think I stop here and let hear uh, the view from the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Sobi. Um, I think we are still waiting and checking on uh, Andiko to rejoin us. So I would like to get a response from Reza Asmi for this question. And as a reminder, what we're looking at the opportunities and new developments that give some potential for a responsible agricultural investment. So we'd like to hear something from the case of Malaysia. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, so again, just uh, context-wise, so in terms of Malaysian land cover under oil palm, I think we're about 5 million or five, uh, maybe 6 million hectares. And maybe 30-40% of that is, is controlled by uh, essentially the, the, these large corporations. Another 30-40% of that sits under some sort of development scheme. And that's primarily the, the area where uh, you know, the beneficiaries are the, the either landless smallholders or uh, smallholder farmers who, who actually own their pieces of land. In, I think what, uh, okay, then the other, the other group are the sort of independent smallholders where, where they, there isn't actually any, any direct uh, link 
to market, but they, they have a place to sell their crops because of all the established uh, mills uh, across the different production regions. So from my, I think from my lens, because we've been involved quite heavily within the development of the round table for sustainable oil palm, which is a sort of multi-stakeholder platform, which it's not just uh, industry, but it's sort of industry NGOs, um, and, and, and the banks involved in this, in this platform, which has been around for about the last 15 years. So within that context, uh, the, 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 the idea for having more responsible, um, uh, more responsibility for the local communities around where these plantations and mills are, has been a sort of key feature of the, the RSPO standards from, from the very beginning. But probably in the last few years, you started to see more you know, sort of specificity in just how or what that means and, and how does the companies demonstrate what they're doing. So then what we're seeing on the ground is that a lot of these RSPO certified companies are starting to look at, well, how do I uh, provide more support for these independent producers who are uh, within their range or are existing suppliers to them? Um, some of the early sort of examples would be, you know, providing better quality material. Um, some are providing services. And then more recently, we started to hear some of the big companies saying, well, maybe we'll just take over the land management of, of these uh, farms. And so that reduces uh, a lot of the costs for them. And, and they, they, they sort of, they will take a cut from, from, the, from the, the, the products that arise from this. Um, but I think with all of this, I mean, all of this is still remains within the band of essentially this industrial model. So it's more uh, monoculture, uh, but now, uh, you know, sort of done within schemes or, or essentially you're just helping the smaller farmers uh, with their monoculture crop. Um, from another dimension through the RSPO as well, again, over the last uh, 15 years or so, we've started to see how the standard has been used as a sort of investment criteria. So there are some parties, uh, people who are thinking of investing in uh, either existing projects or new projects, uh, where they are using a number of the critical criteria within the RSPO, which includes the, the, the provisions for fair and uh, free and prior informed consent, um, the, the need for having um, you know, sort of HCV assessment, so the sort of environmental uh, due diligence and, and all of those things are, are one of the key requirements within, uh, in, within this sort of lens of uh, looking at new developments. So I think that's a positive thing. Um, however, what I don't see in the Malaysian context is how all these efforts within these international investments or inter international investors looking at projects in Malaysia and Indonesia um, we don't see a crossover with the national banks, for example, um, and, we, and we don't see this with, with a lot of the, the sort, of, sort of, I mean, from that sort of sector. Um, so I think that that would be kind of interesting to see whether they will adopt a similar stance in terms of using a standard like the RSPO to, to screen uh, whether investments will go ahead or not, or whether these are things that, that need to be excluded. So. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave it as that. Over to you. Thank you so much, Reza. Um, to give an update, uh, apparently we, we are getting communication. There was, there was a, there's been a power cut um, in um, Mr. Andiko's area. So he is, he is not able to get on internet at the moment. We will, we will proceed with the webinar and hope that the situation changes and he can rejoin us. Otherwise, what we can do is try and, and consider a means by which we can still put forward and uh, reflect his responses in, in the reporting and, um, and sort of supplements to, to outputs from this webinar. Um, what I do what, what I do know is that certainly to talk about opportunities, he, he also wants to look at sort of um, promotion of sustainable pole arm and certification systems and, and, and legal developments in 
Indonesia so so I'm, I think there would be kind of very interesting crossover and kind of um, cross learning with Malaysia there um, however maybe he will be able to rejoin us to tell you himself um, in the meantime I think what we can just do because we're already getting some questions in we can move on to to our third and final questions and hear from Sylvie and Reza and then and then move to the Q&A and hope that Antico joins us at a, another moment. So the third question, I mean, this, this follows on from the promotion of responsible agricultural investment. And I would like to mention the ASEAN guidelines on responsible agricultural investment. Um, th these were a set of guidelines um, that cover 10 areas of agricultural production, and they were adopted by ASEAN in 2018. Um, I mean, in actuality, they pretty much follow the guidelines at a global level put forward by the Committee on World Food Security, or CFES. So there's two parts to this question. The first part is how visible are the ASEAN guidelines on responsible agricultural investment in your country? Um, ha have you come across them? Um, and the second part, do you see them having use? Are they useful for your own work? So perhaps firstly, I'm, I'm gonna go straight back to Reza Asmi for a response on that. Right. I think it was helpful when there was three of us. <laughs> Um, okay, um, I, I think, I mean, I had a look at the, the ASEAN guidelines, and I must say that I think from my, from my side, you know, it, it's, it's very new. Um, I, I'm also wondering, in the context of Malaysia, where there, there's very limited uh, projects around smallholders, just because most of them, I mean, most of the smallholder projects are actually within these sort of development scheme projects. Um, I'm not sure how, how the ASEAN uh, lending guidelines would sort of fall into that uh, category. But then it goes back to my point before, which is that, you know, I'm, we're not seeing how there's more additional responsible criteria being added into investments, uh, uh, in, into investment uh, criteria. Um, and in some ways, that's a shame, uh, because when I actually look at the ASEAN guidelines, there, there are some good things in there. And one of the things which sort of jumped or jumped out at me when I was looking at it was that, especially for smallholders, um, it's sort of lit, written in a very sort of fuzzy way. But essentially what it's saying is that it's promoting sustainable land management. And I think if I reflect back on the this model that we've inherited, should all land development be this industrial model, which was this hundred year old experiment, which I think doesn't work everywhere. Number two is that the industrial model also doesn't respect soil, which is fundamental for any form of sustainable agriculture. There's heavy mechanization, uh, the natural soil fertility has more or less disappeared because that's the reason why we have so much dependency on uh, chemical or inorganic fertilizers. And when we started to look at this from the context of smallholders, we realized that all of these industrial kind of model, essentially the industrial model when applied to smallholders with their very small land area makes them very, very, uh, I mean, their profits are actually very small. And then there's this whole risk of being, you know, any commodity drops in commodity prices, they're, they're affected quite badly. So I started to see, well, okay, well, maybe if we look at sustainable land management in, in a different way, perhaps we should look at seeing the agroforestry model or a shift from monocultures to polycultures. And our own sort of trials around organic production and oil palm actually show you that you can not depend 100% on, uh, on, on bought fertilizer once you understand that natural soil fertility is built up by adding more organic content back to your soils. 
because it's the mycorrhizas, it's the bacteria in the soils, which are actually the fundamental building blocks for soil fertility, but also for good plant health. So that's something that's kind of missing, but you're seeing it with the smallholders. They are practicing this. However, their yields may be uh, maybe not optimum compared to the industrial plantation, but their cost is lower. In fact, so they're actually making more profits. So then on the other side, if you look at polycultures, you, you're then saying, well, why not add trees? Why not add different crops to your farm block? And now you've got layering of income in a small area. Your profitability is starting to go up. And as long as it's a polyculture in an organic production uh, model, to me, I feel this is the, the, the better way to go in, in the form of a model that's appropriate for small producers who have access to labor or it's a small enough area that they can manage themselves or with family groups, but their income potential is much better compared to taking you know, what we're seeing with this industrial model uh, with oil palm or other commodities. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Fraser, and, and, and thank you for jumping in for a, an immediate answer directly after your previous one. Um, I, there was a kind of reason to have you first then. Um, I mean, if there is a certain parallel here also with what uh, I think Andiko would, would have been saying about there is some knowledge of the, the ASEAN guidelines in in Indonesia, but there's no real means to kind of promote or kind of um, bring them, make them active. So um, I want that to go first because I think it's now interesting to hear from Solvi where there's from the case of Cambodia, where I think there there is a, maybe a, a bit more of an active role for the guidelines. So Solvi, I invite you to give a response. Uh, thank you, Daniel. So regarding the Asian guideline or the responsible agricultural investment, I think from my work experience and working with relevant stakeholders, the, the guidelines have good visibility in Cambodia, at least among like the key officials at the Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry and Fishery, some NGOs and also private companies. Who are investing in agriculture and land sector? I think it uh, provides a good foundation uh, for the company, also public sector, to consider what are the factors that they should consider for and call responsible investment, either in agriculture or food. Uh, in Cambodia, uh, I think the guideline is not uh, mandatory, but it play as a basic uh, foundation for consideration and implementation by different stakeholders. But uh, the government committee have uh, initiated its own law and policy to promote the uh, inclusive and also responsible agricultural investment, uh, mainly contract farming laws and other related uh, policy that have been just and negotiated with private company and NGOs and uh, related uh, actors. Uh, to me, I think the guideline, uh, it could trigger consideration of what factors should be considered as responsible and inclusive uh, investment model. What are the role and responsibility of the relevant stakeholder from government to NGOs, companies, communities, and farmers themselves? And what are the mechanisms that those stakeholders should work together to achieve their specific uh, objective that call inclusive and responsible under, each, uh, under the 10 guidelines. And uh, it is also beneficial because of the flexibility and adaptation of the guideline that can be, that each country can adapt to their different context and uh, uh, legal framework. Yeah, that's my view from Cambodia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have some good news and that Miss, Mr. Andiko has uh, found his way back to our cyber, cyber meeting place. So um, Andiko, we, we have now worked through 
kind of the answers for the three questions. So I, I would, I basically, it's, it, we would, we would kind of like to hear also on the Indonesian perspective. So I give you the floor to give your responses to all the questions. Oh, I, yes, to give your responses to all the questions. Um, I do know that you were part of the way through your response to question one. Um, so I give you the choice if you would like to complete that response or move on to a, re a reply for question two and three. H how, how would you like to respond? Okay, thank you, Pa, uh, quickly. Uh, yeah, uh, we have problem about the uh, smallholder in Indonesia because there is some uh, uh, transform uh, Uh, the, uh, land acquisition, yeah, process in Indonesia to transfer the right from the community to the uh, big company. And the second question, uh, uh, we have opportunity now uh, to influence the situation. There is some uh, project, a program about from my government about the agrarian reform, social forestry, and Uh, this day, uh, we have uh, the new regulation about how to recognize the community right under the, the new law uh, today. Now, the ASEAN standards should influence the, the content of the new law and how to implement and how to bridging the new uh, relationship among the uh, big company and a uh, community under the new uh, this law yeah uh, and indonesian has the uh, like uh, for example uh, human right uh, and business uh, agenda this is uh, official under the my government and we can using that and a few big big company for example from the palm oil industry and uh, pop and paper has the strong commitment yeah, public commitment to recognize the smallholder recognize the indigenous people and uh, right of local people we should uh, invite the uh, the company to follow the uh, asian standard but the problem is Not much people hear about the Asian standard for for agriculture. There is no focal point in Indonesia, and there is no uh, some uh, meeting or some some publication about that. Yeah, not enough uh, publication from ASEAN or from my government about uh, how to implement the Asian standard. Now, uh, from my experience. If we talking about the standard, we need to increase the community capacity to uh, uh, to watching to uh, how to standard uh, to be to be implement and uh, in the ground around the company in uh, area uh, land based business in Indonesia. Maybe that part. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andika, and particularly thank you for st stepping in and immediately jumping to all your responses. Um, it's very much appreciated. So now we, we, were, we have a few questions coming in already. Um, just before we go to these questions, um, if you're leaving now, please let us know what you think about this webinar. Um, by filling out a short survey. And Romy will be posting the link for this in the chat box. Your feedback is much appreciated, but um, also don't forget that we will also be having some further reflections um, and comments from Rob Cole at the end of the Q&A. So it's well worth sticking around for that. Um, now for, just, we, have some, we have various questions. Some of them are open. Uh, to all panelists and some are directed. So what I will do is um, mix the questions around to, diff, uh, to different presenters. So first of all, um, 
a question for, and I will, I will apologize now for any mispronunciation of names, but a first question from Sophie Fia, um, and this is to Chan Sobi Ngon. Uh, could you please elaborate more about how the ownership of land prevent, how ownership, land ownership prevents women from exercising or claiming their rights to land in Cambodia? Sophie, could you, do you have a response? Uh, thank you, Danyang, and also thank you, Sophie, for the question. I think in Cambodia, the land ownership of women and men is different and uh, are dominated by men because of, I can call it the culture or the norm that uh, in the family after you get married, normally when you have the asset register, it's under the man name. But later on, because of the advocacy or some uh, demanding that at least women can share the land ownership with men. So I think it's getting uh, better, but still the dominant are men for the land ownership. And there are also like differentiation between the, like but if, you are if you are talking about the crop, the cash crop and uh, uh, subsistence crop. So cash crop uh, normally go to men and uh, something for to support your family, it will go to women. I think it's more, it's not about the policy or anything, but it's more about the culture and the uh, view of the women themselves. And sometimes I think it's not important. It just under the name of their husband, it should be fine. But in the law and policy, I think they, uh, it is encouraged for both to have their name on the land title or land ownership. That is my uh, views and experience uh, from Cambodia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, for a, a second, we have a second question here from Justine Sylvester. Um, Justine, thank you for your question. Uh, the question goes first. I, I, it is to Reza and Sophie. Um, I will first of all direct it to Dr. Reza and then Chan Sophie, if you, if you have any additional response, the floor is yours. So the question is, Andy co-noted that there is no obligation for forestry investors to consult with communities prior to investing. How about in Malaysia and Cambodia? Any, are there any obligations for FBIC by investors under domestic laws? So first I'd like to go to um, Reza Asmi. Yeah, I think this is a little bit, uh, I guess it's some ex I guess the, sim the, sim the simpler answer is because FBIC as a concept isn't adopted by the Malaysian government in any way, uh, one could say it doesn't really apply. I mean, it isn't applied in, in what FBIC is actually, what, what actually FBIC means. Where we're starting to see some of its usage is within those companies who are on an RSPR program or are are intending to be in an RSPR program because then they would have to apply this on their existing developments or, or into new projects. But I think the other thing to, to remember from Malaysia is that the extent of customary land will differ whether you are in Peninsular Malaysia or whether you're in Borneo. And in the context of Peninsular Malaysia, most of the time, these are the smaller communities of indigenous people who are essentially living within what are the, the forest areas. And in the context of Sabah and Sarawak, it's then much more widely uh, dispersed. So FBIC would be then an issue for projects which are within the state forests within Peninsula Malaysia, and we're seeing a number of examples of this. And in the case of Sabah and Sarawak, where you have these semi-government slash private investments in concessions which overlap in customary land areas, then you have all these issues around FPIC here. So anyway, I, I think I'll pass you over to Cambodia. Sylvie, do, do you have any further further response? Uh, thank you. 
I think EPIC is uh, has been promoted by NGOs who are working to protect the rights of the community people and to minimize the impacts from the development project. But I don't think it is the mandatory law or policy from the government. From the government side, they have the ELC process for all the project to do prior to their uh, operation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we now have a question for, firstly for Andiko, and then if any other panelist wishes to also respond. And it's a question from John Meadows. Uh, thank you, John. In the context, this is the question, um, in the context of the value chain, are the speakers aware of any positive impacts that the informed consumer is having on responsible investment practices and ensuring the equality of rights for smallholders? It appears that application of ASEAN guidelines is arbitrary and that large scale food and com commodity producers still exist, exert enormous power. So it's about where, where is the consumer having a voice in this process? So, um, and Andiko, do you have any response, first of all, to that? Yeah, based on Indonesian uh, every, uh, experience, yeah. Maybe since uh, 10 years ago, there is uh, so big uh, campaign about market campaign, yeah, I mean, yeah, about the supply chains uh, related with palm oil, timber plantation uh, and uh, international commodity, other international commodity, yeah. And uh, uh, the parties, yeah, industry parties, yeah, related with land base in Indonesia uh, look like meet with some uh, power, uh, some reason uh, to change, yeah, because I know, yeah, so many big uh, company only aware about the market or uh, not aware about the law yeah because the law commonly uh, still lower than uh, market standard yeah we need some uh, uh, some ad advocacy and some comment from market to change the the uh, value change yeah value change about the industry and industry will be uh, moving forward and government will be follow the process of uh, the circle of uh, market system uh, around the world yeah now uh, based on my experience uh, if there is some uh, market com a strong market uh, uh, common from europe for example yeah uh, uh, this is uh, give me uh, like direct and direct uh, di direct and not direct impact in the ground in Indonesia and slowly slowly we we can change the uh, Indonesian change the a few regulation related with the industry I would like to underline yeah uh, my point uh, the market common uh, this is an uh, important point to change the, the bad situation in the ground and uh, push the uh, government to change the a few regulations. For example, Indonesian uh, was producing the standard of Indonesian palm oil sustainability uh, standard uh, to respond, yeah, to respond the market demand. Uh, interna international market demand how to send the, the clear and clean product from Indonesia to uh, market because uh, for example like uh, oil palm this is a product for international market not only for uh, uh, Indonesian uh, market yeah now international market will be make a better uh, situation in Indonesia through the standard uh, look like the Asian standard, how to change uh, situation. 
including the the quality of FPIC because in the obligation in Indonesia only aware about FPIC uh, only about the consultation not consent yeah uh, if we talking FPIC in we talking about the consultation not consent now this is so strong situation in the ground related with the uh, land acquisition from community to company thank you thank you andiko would any of the other panelists like to also jump in and give a response to this question on um, the potential impact of the consumer razor I, I yeah i think um I, I mean oil palm has been in the spotlight for 15, well, 15 20 years now um and i think that the, we got there largely because it became a consumer camp i mean uh, an ngo led campaign to raise consumer awareness about i guess the rates of deforestation and how this was uh, you know, and, and then so the, the whole idea of like growing oil palm and this was killing orangutans and forests and, and, and etc. Um, so, and, and I think that was the, the fundamental basis behind it. And that's why we've had these, you know, a lot of attention over a lot of the big companies who were connected to this global supply chain moving in a certain direction uh, to meet the RSPO standards. So I would say that yes, uh, it does have have an impact, and if if you then look, you know, 15 years later, you're starting to see a similar movement within the rubber sector, for example. And I think there's a similar standard being launched this year, or it was launched last year. Um, and yeah, so so that's also happening, and there's also a response from national governments because they're starting to say, well, if if then if these are the criteria, then we also want to to have a similar standard. So so now we've got the Malaysian Sustainable Palm Oil Standard. But sometimes I feel that you know is it all a little bit too late? Because the whole point of these campaigns were we wanted to have forests or natural areas protected. And I think if that was the goal 20, 25 years ago, I think we lost the point. I mean we've lost we've lost that. Uh, if we look at peat, for example. There was a lot of interest to protect this for many, many different reasons. Um, but there's only a fraction of natural peatlands that remain today. And most of that is sitting under some form of industrial agricultural plantation. So anyway. Thank you. Um, Okay, so we, you, the next question is directly to you. So shall I move? Would you like to comment on this question? Otherwise, I go to the next one. Uh, you can go to the next one, please. Okay, so your next question, you have a question di uh, specifically for Cambodia. Um, what happened after the 2012 moratorium in Cambodia? Um, the expansion of ELCs is totally stopped. Is there, are, or are there any concrete government measures to solve the land related issues. Um, this, this is a, I don't have a name behind this question. So it's given anonymously. Uh, thank you for the question. As far as I know, and from my experience working in this sector after the 2012 moratorium on the ESG project, there are no more land, ESG land allocation to any company, either local or foreign. And there are also uh, the reduction of the ESC project, either cancel or revoke the land side. Uh, so far, that I think the previously the land uh, ESC land uh, area was around two million something, but now it has been reduced to only one million uh, something. That is the measure of the government for the ESC management regarding the land conflict. It was controversial when the ELC project have just started and granted. And it has been going on between the local people and the companies. And there are uh, solutions by the government and policy intervention also from the NGO as well. 
even it has been significantly reduced, but I think there are still some uh, overlapping land claim or conflict that is going on, but significantly uh, reduced. And the uh, government has also taken a different measure to address the conflict as well so far. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we may just have time for one more question, which can be, I will first put to Andiko, but then um, every panelist can give a response. Um, this is a question for, um, from Harry Behera, um, and it goes as thus. Is there any national level land use policy to preserve fertile land for agriculture in the countries discussed today? If so, what are their implications so far? So um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to know, uh, Andiko, do you have any response to this question? Yeah, we have uh, a few regulation about land use, yeah. But uh, the problem is uh, not enough recognition, yeah, recognize uh, to indigenous people, right, yeah. Uh, Indonesia not easy to get the recognition from government because we need uh, uh, district uh, some kind of district uh, regulation to uh, uh, to get the recognition for indigenous people in Indonesia. Uh, if we want to get the recognition. Uh, we will be meet with the long way politic uh, rule uh, to develop or uh, to make a regulation. Nah, uh, in under the the gap of uh, uh, position uh, uh, in the field, uh, company has the many right yeah from the state, and he meet with the uh, community who the community doesn't have uh, formally recognition from in the uh, government from the law yeah now uh, the company uh, only give uh, like uh, small small like compensation because there is no uh, land title there is no formal land title and uh, map some kind of like that yeah uh, the, the company uh, still uh, invite the community to the table of negotiation but the company talking about the uh, where is your land title formal land title uh, like uh, Daniel mentioned before or uh, in the preliminary Indonesian uh, living in the uh, legal pluralism the community using the adat law customary law Oh, there is no uh, uh, land title, a yeah, formal land title under the customary law, but the company has the backup, big backup from uh, state law, yeah. And he's still talking about the uh, certificate, about the formal map, and some kind of like that, yeah. Uh, I would like to underline, yeah. There is the gap, yeah, gap capacity, uh, gap the protection uh, from the uh, state law to parties in the within the uh, land-based uh, business in my country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, are there any further responses from the other panelists? I see nobody mute. Unmuting. So, in that case, I think we are running a little short on time. So, what I would like to do is move on to some final reflections for this session. Um, apologies for all those who posted questions we have not had time to answer, but um, hopefully, this discussion continues further outside this particular webinar and um, things will become clearer. Uh, however, to close this webinar with some with some final thoughts, um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Rob Cole from MRLG. Rob, the floor is yours. 
Thanks very much, Daniel. And thanks to the panel and also to everyone who asked uh, these fascinating questions. Um, we had a really interesting discussion there on questions of the value of ideas like FPIC, the RAI guidelines and actual practices on the ground and whether um, consumer and market preference is actually the ultimate decider. All of these are long-term processes and all during that time, resources continue to be depleted and um, land conflicts continue. So um, in my commentary, what I'd like to do is draw together some of the perspectives from the three countries and then offer a few points on the potential and limitations of the guidelines on responsible agricultural investments. So we've heard from our three speakers a kind of microcosm of land issues in Southeast Asia. First, the exit from colonial control and reworking of land governance that followed, um, often recreating or reinforcing power structures relating to control over the land base. More recently, this power has been applied to direct flows of lucrative foreign investments in land intensive commodities, industrial plantations or resource extraction. Um, in the cases of Malaysia and Indonesia, the impacts are stark and well known millions of hectares of land transformed to oil palm for consumer products in distant markets. In Cambodia, which has faced similar impacts um, from economic land concessions, attention is now turning to somewhat towards uh, contract farming. And in this regional commodity, uh, commodification process, smallholders um, often face difficult choices. Some are in a position to adapt and gain from new opportunities. Others face displacement from the resources that they depend on. So that uh, I think brings us neatly back to the title of this webinar, which is Don't Forget the Smallholder. So for the Mekong Region Land Governance Projects, our overall focus is to protect smallholder land tenure. Um, within that, my work is about promoting more inclusive and do, do no harm agricultural investments uh, with the ASEAN Rai guidelines as a reference. Um, a key question is how much can we rely on voluntary guidelines to offer solutions? So in the last couple of minutes, I'll just highlight um, that this is a point really where um, words have to be turned into actions and that the principles on responsible agricultural investment will only be useful to us if they're effectively communicated and adopted in practice. So a key challenge is that short-term high-risk invest investments generally do not incentivize responsible practices because obviously the investor knows they have a short period with which to maximize their profits. For longer-term investments, it starts to be more in the interest of investors to look after the land base and the workforce for their own um, ongoing business model. This um, is generally the point when companies start to have more visible CSR programs. So the question is how to make responsible investment in the interest of all types of agribusiness. And the starting point should not be to say, hey, everybody, here's a whole brand new set of guidelines that we all now, now have to follow because a lot of the content of the RAI guidelines already comes from existing efforts. So uh, the voluntary guidelines on responsible governance of land tenure, for example, and also FPIC, which we heard during the discussion. Um, so we need to be clear in our communication and our um, work to promote RAI that these guidelines aren't reinventing these tools, but instead they bring them together under a single framework to address common problems that we see time and time again in relation to agricultural investments. Um, a key related critique is the extent that the RAI guidelines can just be another um, box checking exercise or worse still, a, another way of greenwashing bad investments and enabling more industrial uh, monocultures as Reza um, mentioned earlier. Uh, the point is that large scale um, agribusiness has reached a kind of critical mass in Southeast Asia. It, it's, there's a lot of momentum behind this um, model of production. And um, 
we are much better off taking a serious look at what tools we can apply to incentivize more responsible investments. Um, if a particular type of investment damages local tenure arrangements, the related guidelines should provide steps that can be taken to protect them. If another investment has negative impacts from a, a gender perspective, the RAI guidelines provide a reference. So in sum, the, the way to use these guidelines effectively is to start from the problem at hand and draw on them as a set of potential solutions. In the end, they are only guidelines. It's up to policymakers to prioritize the needs of smallholders above those of investors. And it's up to investors to recognize that they profit from the same land base that smallholders depend on for their livelihoods. Thanks everybody. And I'll hand back to Daniel. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. So that brings us to the end of this webinar. Um, I'd like to thank all of our presenters for their contributions today. Um, thank you also for all of your questions and, participa and participation today. Um, I think Romy has posted in the chat box uh, a, a web address where you can watch this again on our YouTube channel. Quite soon there will also be a report on this webinar available through the Land Portal website. Otherwise, um, we'd like to, on behalf of uh, Lamport, I'd like to kind of wish everybody a fabulous rest of the day and all the best. So bye for now. <laughs>